following interview was conducted with Christine Anderson, Professor of Library Science for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, June 9, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Christine, welcome and thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank Let's start. You. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. I was born on August 1, 1945 in Astoria, Oregon. Um, my father's name was Elvin C. Anderson. My mother was Hilda Ellen Anderson. Um, my brother Kenneth was born in 1948. When I was um, about four years old, we moved to Warrenton, Oregon, which was just a short distance away, and um, that's where I was born and raised and you know, went to grade school and high school. Um, my father died in 1952 when I was seven years old after a long illness. And um, my mother basically supported the family by uh, working in the local fish cannery. Mm. Um, what was high school and, and what was grade school like? And well, um, I attended the Wharton grade school and the Wharton high school. Um, some of the teachers that I remember, um, Mrs. Peterson in the fourth grade, I remember that because every, um, you know, every day after lunch we'd have a rest period and she would read to us. And another one of the teachers I remember was um, Mr. Brown in the seventh grade. And what he would do is um, he would take pictures, usually covers from the Saturday evening post. Um, often they were like Norman Rockwell illustrations and he would post them on a bulletin board and our assignment was to write a story that would fit that. And so that was an assignment that I enjoyed um, very much. Um, I joined the band, um, I think it was in the sixth grade, I started learning how to play the clarinet and um, I remained a member of the band playing the clarinet throughout high school as well. Were there special concerts or was there, did you participate at the, any athletic events? Did the band play at like games or anything like that? Or uh, that? Yeah, in high school, yeah, we did. We did yeah. play at the games, yeah. So um, I was not that interested. I don't think I ever really understood football. I, I did kind of like the basketball games, but I've, I've never really been um, a great sports enthusiast. But um, yeah, I did play in the band, you know, that meant often, you know, trips to other little towns in mm -hmm. Oregon. And um, so, so that, was, that was quite interesting. Right. What, was you, what course of study did you have? Was it for I was, um, I, I pursued the academic course of study. Now we had a, a business course of study available as well, but I mean I think I always wanted to go to college, although I did somehow have the prescience to realize that, you know, typing as a skill would uh, one day come in very handy. And so I wheedled my mother into letting me take a summer um, typing course. I think that was like between the eighth, eighth and ninth grades. Um, our high school began in the ninth grade and ended. So it was a seat grade. 9 through 12? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Was it a large high school, Christine? There were 50 in my graduating class, so yeah, no, it's, this is small town, small mm -hmm. town. Though. Small school, so it was probably one, right. one high school for the, for the town, probably, or not, or was there another one, probably? Yes, it had, um, it had one high school, um, Hammond, Oregon, which was um, a neighboring little community um, had a grade school at that time. Um, at some point, I think it was around when I first started high school, they changed the system and they had junior high in Hammond. Um, and um, instead of grade school, and then of course all the Hammond students had to come to the Wharton High right. School. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, comes graduation. What was the next step? after high school. Right, yeah. Well, um, between my freshman and senior year, another um, momentous event occurred when my mother had a stroke and, a, um, and an aneurysm. And so, I mean, at that point, um, I had to, um, my brother and I went and lived with an aunt in Astoria 
um, but luckily I knew how to drive, so you know I, we could still keep on going to school in Wharton and um, s driving back and forth. So, um, so did that your, happened. Did your mother? Ha was she? She wasn't at home. Was she was a, in a. No, she. Um, it was really you know very um, damaging stroke. She, uh, she was actually you know pretty disabled mentally you know and physically for the rest of her was life. Even a, though she lived till eighty three. Did she stay? At, we'll live in a home then of some sort or a hospital. Um, yeah, at that point she was living in a nursing home um, for a while. We brought her back and she um, lived at home for a while and. Then at some point, my mother, who'd had my grandmother, who'd had a stroke before my mother did, came and lived with my grandmother and my brother. You know, lived in the family house as well. And um, but by that time, I was um, headed for college. You know, at that time, my mother had a stroke. There was some thought. You know, well, I should forget about going to college. But I did um, get scholarships. I got a tuition scholarship to the University of Oregon. Of course, I mean, it was, tuition was unbelievably cheap in those days. It was, you know, like about $1,000 for the whole year. And, um, and then I had another scholarship that was called the William W. Stout Scholarship, and that pretty much paid my, my living expenses, my room and board. Right, okay. And so, and so then I also got a, a work-study job, and I did that for a while. Um, working in the library. Um, yeah, one of the things that I forgot to say was um, that's kind of interesting that my first library job was during my high school years and it was in my little town library, Warrington Library, which was a one-room library oh. sort of annexed to the um, City Hall. The um, Librarian was really the receptionist secretary for the uh, the mayor and so forth, and she worked in the she city had two hall. Roles. <laughs> right? Yeah, she she wore two hats, you know. But but I mean, she looked over a library journal and she developed the collection, yeah, you know, very nice. well. Yeah. So um, so I was an avid reader and patron of that library. So um, at one point, she um, invited me to come and work there after school and so basically my job there was to um, check out books to people and you know shelve them after the day. Okay. So it was like you know two days a week it was only open two days a week and I went there after school for about an hour and a half until five and I made I think I made like a dollar thirty-five an hour or something like that. Very good. <laughs> Got a good start. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah that was when I was, I was 14. So, yeah, so, so actually, so then I had a work-study job um, at the university, and that was in the library as well. I worked in the cataloging department. What was your course of study there, and what was campus life like? Um, I was um, majored in English. I decided to major in English, which, you know, wasn't a very practical decision, but, you know, that was but what was I was interest? interested in. Right. And... Um, my first year, my first semester, well, actually it was quarter, they were on the quarter system. I was deathly afraid I was going to flunk, so, you know, I really didn't take advantage of any extracurricular events, except I think I actually was in the band. I, I was going to ask you, what in, happened to yeah. that musical uh, expertise? Yeah, yeah. I, I played in the band there at university for two years, and then after that, I decided I was really more interested in other things, so so I, I no longer played in the band, and I sort of I don't even know what happened to my clarinet anymore. <laughs> it's, it was probably you know deposited in one of my residences during my my moves. <laughs> so um, yeah, so um, yeah, so I majored in English, but I was also interested in foreign languages. You know, of course they had a core curriculum, so my first two years I had certain required courses to take. Um, my first semester I was deathly afraid I was going to flunk biology, but I actually aced biology. <laughs> and, and I actually did enjoy biology too, you know. But then I was, I was always um, math phobic. So um, when I realized I'd have to take math, 
I, um, you know, knew I would major in biology. <laughs> but I mean, I did, I did enjoy those studying yeah, biology right. very much. But I also took French. I took a French course, you know, every year, and then I also. I took Russian, I think, for two years, and I took Swedish maybe for for one year. So, so those are those were the things I was mostly interested right, in. Right, and you enjoyed literature. enjoyed them. Where did you did you live in a residence hall or off campus or? Well, my first um, my first um, year there, it was required for us to live in uh, a dormitory. So right, I right. lived in my freshman year. I lived in a dorm. But then after that, you know, this was like in the 60s, you know, and everything was changing yeah. and they were loosening up on their rules. And so after the first year, they allowed um, undergraduates, women, it was really more an issue with women at that time. I mean, because women had these, you know, had these rules that men didn't have to obey. And that really made me a little bit angry. <laughs> you know, yeah. we, had to, we had curfews, men didn't have curfews. So, but then after a year, they did let us um, live off campus, and then at that point, is that what you moved off? Yeah, campus? I lived in I lived in apartments after okay. that. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, after you finished, then what 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 came next? Did you go on for? You got your MLS after you graduated, huh? Or right. So, um, so basically, what happened was when I finished my my BA, um, I I was real. I really didn't know exactly what to do, but. So, so I started a graduate program in comparative literature, and I had a TA um, in the English department teaching um, English composition. And um, at that point in my life, I really um, did not like teaching. because I, I felt really self-conscious in front of um, groups of students. And I just, you know, so, so I kind of it made me realize that teaching was not a profession for me, you know, certainly at least not at that point. But, I mean, during that same year, the University of Oregon was beginning um, a library school, and, um, which they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So um, after about one year of comparative literature, I switched to a um, library school program. And, um, and that's when I, I did my MLS. Now, the interesting thing is that that library program only lasted about 10 years, you know, and then... Was it, did it get accredited, though? I mean, was oh, it was accredited. Okay. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, when I start, I think when I started it, you know, when I first went and I inquired about it, they told me, well, it's not accredited yet, but it will be. And it was, it was okay. accredited by the time I graduated. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, and it lasted for ten years, and then like they had a budget shortfall, and so they solved it by yeah. you know ending that school. I remember Keith Dowden. I remember him. He yeah. went to Columbia, and he was always he always used to say to me he felt so sad when they closed it because that was one of the earliest yeah. library schools and had a lot of key yeah. people that were graduates of that, and he enjoyed it, you know, because he was lived in New York and raised in New York. You know. Yeah. Okay, then what uh, we moved on, uh, then what came next after you got your MLS? Did you start working in a library or? Yeah, at that point, um, I, was, I was kind of eager to get away from Oregon, you know, for a number of different reasons. And so, I mean, just sort of, I was applying for all kinds of jobs, um, including, you know, I was looking at jobs on the East Coast, you know. I mean, it would be quite a jump for me to go from Oregon to to the East Coast, but, you know, I was ready for it. And so I finally, um, I got a bite from the University of New Brunswick in Canada, in Fredericton, Canada. And um, the uh, librarian, his name was Gertrude Gunn, and she, um, she interviewed me over the phone. It was a phone interview. And she hired me just on the basis of the phone interview. So um, Boy, that's a big tra trek. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from Oregon. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it was, it was interesting. You know, I um, was this in an academic library. Yeah, right. Oh. University of New Brunswick. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah was what academic. was your position? What did you do there? It was, I was collections, a collections librarian. I think I think this librarian, um, she was new, and I think maybe there were different. There were different. Um, changes going on at the time so this may have been 
a new position. They did have a, a head of collections there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, this was this was in the day when, before they could order a book, they had to um, search, you know, in Library of Congress catalogs and so forth to make sure that the citation was correct before they could, because they wanted to make sure they were ordering the right thing. And the thing. price was right too. It had the exact price. You had to check yeah, the they price. had the exact price, exact. Um, you know, publisher, date, all of this stuff. And so, so they had people there um, who were searchers, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so that was also one of the things, is learning the job that I learned how to do searching and um, different things like that. Right, yeah. And so, but I only lasted with that job for two years. And so, again, for various reasons, I decided, you know, to come back to the States which may have what been What was like state. in New Brunswick? Did you enjoy, did you do any traveling in Canada when you were there at all or not? Yeah, I did. I did do some traveling in there. Not, not a lot, but um, I think I, I went to Toronto once. Mm-hmm. Um, I had an interest in science fiction, so there was a science fiction convention in Toronto, so I flew to Toronto for that. Um, yeah, I think I went to Montreal. Mm-hmm. I, I've I've traveled in Canada since then. since then yeah, since right. then as well yeah yeah it was um, I mean at that time you know I haven't really been back to Fredericton since then well maybe once but you know it was kind of a small town it was I probably a lot like you know like West Lafayette sure. a, lot, a lot of people were interested in um, hunting and fishing and that sort of thing sure. and. Um, you know, the the university was kind of, you know, the cultural center of the, right. the town. Yeah. That was but a good, I th- good I th- start. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's grown quite a bit since then. But, again, I haven't been back there in years. Right, yeah. Okay, this, when, now we get our master's. Is that what's coming next? You're going to get your master's in? Well, English? the next thing that happened since I, you know, I was um, tired of, um, you know, well, not tired of it, but I decided to come back to the States and so I applied for jobs, and I got a, a job in Boston at Northeastern University. So, um, so I came back, and I worked at New Northeastern University, and one of the benefits that they offered there were um, free uh, tuition for, course, for two courses a quarter. Again, they were on the quarter system as well, wow. which was, you know, which enabled me to... Um, to do my um, my second MA, my NMA in English, right. and um, so um, yeah, so that was what that department was interesting. Were you, were you working yeah, in I was I was a reference librarian, and it was it was kind of interesting there because um, that was really all I did. I was on reference. Um, my um, schedule I think was like from from eight thirty till four thirty. And then um, I had a colleague who came in at um, noon and worked until 8.30 at night. Okay. Was this like a general library or, one, or a special it was, library? It was a pretty general, it okay. was a general okay. library. Okay. Yeah, although they did have some small departmental libraries mm-hmm. as well. Okay. They had a chemistry library and a psych library, which were really pretty small. You know, I mean, like Purdue. You know, like they our had small one librarian that we used to have. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. They had one one librarian, but I think they maybe only had about three or four of those. So, yeah. and then everything else was in. It was called the Dodge Library, and so um, yeah. So that's really basically what I did was you know sit on the reference desk, you know, for and help patrons there, and help right. patrons for eight <laughs> right. hours. You know, it's great. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I would have other little projects to do. You know, but um, a lot of them never got finished. Yeah, reference can keep you in those days. Could keep you pretty busy. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, like here, it you know, it it um, had its busy times and its slack right, times. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then uh, what, now we are we going to move on. What came next before you start on your PhD? Well, um, when I was uh, working on my master's. Um, one of my professors, um, you know, encouraged me to go on for a PhD, and so I started thinking, you know, back about comparative literature again, 
and um, but this time I, I had kind of a plan because um, I started getting interested in translation and translation studies and in fact you know there was um, at Harvard they had this Harvard extension and somebody I think it was Harvard extension it may have been they also had Cambridge had these courses you know that they offered too well, either one of these places I had a course, somebody was offering a course in translation. And so I acquired an interest in that. And so then when I started looking for um, universities to um, do um, comparative literature, I started focusing on ones that had some sort of program in translation. You know, and so, so I was more organized around about it at that time. You had a plan. Yeah, and I visited several of universities and finally, you know, I visited um, SUNY Binghamton and that seemed to be a good good place for me and they offered me um, an assistantship, a teaching assistantship. So, I mean, so at that point in my life I just, you know, basically dropped out of librarianship and, you know, went home right. like back to grad school. And... Um, how long did it take you? A couple of years to get it? It or? took me four and a half, four and a half years. Um, I really worked very hard on finishing it. Now I know, you know, some of my friends, you know, got as far as the dissertation, and then they just, you know, took their time in, in finishing the dissertation, which can be difficult. I think, you know, I mean, I see people around here who are struggling with, with, you yeah. know, trying to put together a. An existence out of these part-time jobs and finish their dissertation. Yeah, it's not easy, not at all. Yeah, so so I, um, but I did make a push for it, and then I did um, defend the dissertation in 1983, and then I started, you know, applying for jobs. I applied for both teaching jobs, university teaching jobs, as well as library jobs. And um, you know, in the meantime, I was doing different um, different jobs. Like um, I did, um, they, they had this Berlitz school there, so I taught some IB, Spanish IBM professors English. Um, I did substitute teaching, a variety of things, and um, and then at some point, I got a job at the um, local community college teaching remedial writing and then one of my professors went on sabbatical so I had a gig as dog sitter and you know got to live in her house and take care of her dog and so um, so finally about in you know I think it was like in December of 83 I um, went to um, the MLA convention in New York City and I saw advertised their uh, job um, as indexer for the MLA bibliography. And so I applied for that job, and I got that job, and I moved to New York City. And, Did you um, live right in, in Manhattan? Yes. I actually um, found um, a room in this place called the Webster Apartments, which was a... Um, it was subsidized housing, and it was established by um, these two men, the Webster brothers, who uh, needed a, they were actually, um, they were part owners or administrators or had something to do with Macy's. And so they wanted to establish this place for the, um, the women clerks to live, a safe place for them to live. Or, say, working at Macy's? Working at Macy's. This okay. was established in the 30s. And... Um, in fact, it's still there, because last year, Charlotte and I went to New York for a visit, and I went there. It's still there, exactly the same. Is it still being used? It's still being used for the same thing. It was. It's a very interesting place. It was. Um, you had just a very Where tiny, is it tiny room. It's on West 34th Street. It is like two so blocks from Macy's. Okay, right. Yeah, two blocks. What is this? 34th is, is Yeah, Macy's. 34th. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So it was it was interesting. I mean, I met a lot of interesting women there. There were, um, you know, aspiring actors who lived there, um, aspiring opera singers. Um, I got to be friends with this.
Korean journalist, you know, who wrote, I think. Maybe so other people, not necessarily those working at Macy's, could also live there? Oh, yeah. Okay. By this time, it was, you know, I don't even know if anybody at Macy's okay. was working there. Okay. I mean, th there were some people who were just living there as um, they had um, um, temp jobs, you know. And, and it was subsidized. You were charged according to um, how much money you were making. And well, that paid for your little room, and they also had a cafeteria where they served dinner and breakfast. So, I mean, so that's really how I met all these oh, other yeah. women, you know, it's by sure. having dinner with them. Right. Yeah. And that's not bad. They get served the food, you'd have to do your own cooking. Yeah. 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 So, um, so, so I actually lived there, you know, all four years. I, I mean, I initially thought it was going to be temporary, but I lived there for four years. And um, I worked for two years at the MLA Bibliography, and then um, I worked in the New York Public Library, uh, Mid Manhattan branch, which had a literature and language section. So I, I got a job there, and so I worked there for two years, and um, and that's you know, and, and at that point. Um, I decided I was tired of, you know, living in a little room, you know, so I started um, looking for academic library jobs again. And um, when was this? This was 1988. So I had um, three interviews um, that spring, um, one at Stanford, one at the University of Florida, and one at Purdue. And Purdue. Um, made me an offer, so I took Purdue's offer. And I have no idea whether the other two places would have offered me the job or not. Did you, did you go for the interviews at the other spots, though? Did you go for the interviews at the yeah, other spots? Yeah, I went for the interviews, yeah. Okay. yeah the, those, these three interviews, you know, they all took place within the space of about two weeks. So, so I was really traveling around there. <laughs> For a while, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Now you're at Purdue. So right. tell about the initial appointment, and then talk a little about uh, duties as a bibliographer and the bibli construct, bibliographic instruction. How that's changed because you've been involved in that, right? So, um, well, initially my position was called humanities um, bibliographer, and um, my job at that point was to work with the. Um, English department mainly, also communications and theater, those, those three departments, although theater at that time was a division of the visual and performing arts department, it was called the department then. And so, um, so my major duties were to, you know, work with the faculty, meet the faculty, find out their, um, their needs as far as, you know, library materials went and, you know, make sure that I ordered the books that they needed. Um, also, um, I was, uh, made myself available to do bibliographic instruction for, you know, whoever, um, might, you know, call on me to do this, um, for those, you know, three departments, and, you know, some of them did call on me, and I did, you know, give these, um, sessions. Yeah. Also, um, at that time, reference was still, you know, a big part of our job, so I was scheduled for um, several hours on the reference right. desk, you know, every, every um, Was Laszlo day. the head of the Yeah, Laszlo was the head of the so Hissy Library, Laszlo Kovash, and he, um, he was the one who hired me. Um, da well, Danyezi was, was the head of the libraries, um, director of libraries at that point. And, um, but he, like, he died, you know, after... Oh, that first semester yeah, that right. I was there. Yeah, that's right. He died about 89, yeah. I think it was. Yeah, yeah well, right. yeah, I think actually, yeah, I started in 88. I think he actually died in 88, too, because, Could be. yeah, because he was really, you know, when he interviewed me, he was kind of sick at that time. But You know, it's amazing. Um, he was in, went through all, he had uh, chemo. He had a lot of yeah. radiation and chemo. He came, and he was in every day almost until he, a few days before he died. Yeah. Which I is just incredible, that. you know. Who's yeah. in there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, really got, talking about the instruction and the, uh, the researchers, you also had what what would the bibliographer would do. They worked liaison with the faculty. That's what you would do, pretty much, huh? 
working right. with Right, okay. yeah. Well, I would work with the faculty, basically find out what their interests were, so I would sure. you know, be able to um, order books that they, that they particularly right. wanted or, you know, and if they, um, you know, wanted a particular book, they, you know, they would ask me to order, and generally I would, I would try, okay. to, try to order it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, your, res your bibliographic instruction, what you gave some classes, but that's changed a lot, hasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, in a sense, in a sense, they still need um, the same, the same stuff. Now, um, at one point, I forget which year it was, um, the, I think, it was, it was the year when Ann Estelle was the, um, the um, head of the graduate studies, and the person who is the head of graduate studies in English also teaches English 501, and so when she was the head of graduate studies, she had this idea of changing the way um, that class had been taught. And so, um, so I talked to her and, you know, I said, well, I'd be interested, you know, in having more involvement in this class. Because before that, it was kind of hit or miss. You know, the professors, you know, if they wanted to ask me to do um, a bibliographic instruction session, they would, they would do it. Sometimes they didn't. You know, the course really didn't seem to have um, any particular um, goal to it. Um, it was, it, it's a difficult course to begin with because um, it, it covers master's students. It's required for master's students, but English is such a diverse department. It's not only literature, it's also um, linguistics, um, composition and rhetoric. ESL, you know, and of course within literature there are all these different um, period divisions in, in literature departments. So, um, so, so basically I think at that time the professor would, you know, basically do what he wanted with that, with that class. Um, I had taken, while I was in Northeastern, I took, you know, a bibliography, a research and bibliography class from the English department. And, you know, I mean, it was quite different than, you know, what they were English, yeah. teaching here. So, so Anne Estelle, um, you know, changed it, and she, she changed it in a way because of um, starting to invite a lot of different guest lectures in there because, um, you know, also we'd gone through a period in which um, literary theory became very dominant in, um, in literature studies. And so, I mean, so there are, all, there are all these different theorists and theories out there that it was felt, you know, people studying literature, whether it's English or foreign languages, you know, needed to know about these philosophers, you sure. know, like Foucault, Derrida, and so forth. And so, so they, they started inviting different guest lectures. So, um, so I became a guest lecturer, and um, I got to have three um, set class sessions with, with them. And I would devote one class session to um, reference works that were mainly in paper, how to find materials in paper, and then another one to um, databases, major databases. And, um, and then a little while later in the semester, after the students had had a chance to um, do their research, get started on it, then I would come in and um, see if they had any questions. Yeah. Now frequently they're very too shy to ask questions, so then I start asking questions. So um, now the last time I did that, it's um, Professor Ryan Sch Schneider has the class now, and, and he warned them that I would ask questions, so they had a lot of questions for me. <laughs> that helps a little <laughs> bit, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. So. Um, so I would say that, you know, I mean, this idea of information literacy, it started growing during the, the 90s, and we started talking about it then, and I, mean, I think the undergraduate library was, was very active in advocating for information literacy. The, the ALA, well, ACRL, you know, came up with their um, information literacy standards about that time, and so... Um, a lot of the involvement of librarians, I think, was in a way, it was to try to convince the faculty that information literacy was 
was important. And so um, th there, was, there was a lot of work on that, you know, throughout the 90s. And um, I mean, there is always the practical problem that, you know, yes, the students need to be more information literate. They need to study more, but, you know, I mean, we as librarians are, you know, very limited. And, you know, even to, um, to um, give course, you know, class sessions to all of the um, English, at that time it was English 101, you know, all of those sessions, Lots. you know, I mean, it was just, you know, impossible. So, so different ways were, were tr devised to try to attack this. Now, the under undergraduate librarians, um, well, when I first came here, actually, I did meet with the mentor groups. The English department has mentor groups for their new TAs. And so I would um, meet with um, the mentor groups and try to sh tell the new TAs, you know, what they basic facts about what they needed to know about the library so they could impart it to their students. And then later, um, the undergraduate librarians were interested in taking that over, so especially, you know, Scott Mandernack. And so then they started doing that, and then they also started making themselves available to do um, class sessions for um, the TAs. And, um, you know, but I mean, they were kept really very, very busy mm. doing that. Uh, well, that's always been the case over the years. That's just a multi-section yeah. thing, and you, you're on demand, you're on call. Yeah. You know, yeah, every semester. And yeah, it's pretty hev yeah. heavily. Uh, yeah, hev heavy requests. Yeah, so so now we have an information literacy um, chair and down chair, and um, you know I think maybe they're going to try to move in a different direction um, with this information literacy. I think it's still important to try to um, hit the um, e these big classes, the English um, writing, introductory writing classes, which is now called English 106, 106 and 108. And, um, and you know, but I mean now, I mean those classes themselves, they've, they've changed a lot, you know, they have different tracks with the different TAs. Some of them are actually, you know, trained more to do um, present PowerPoint presentations. Some of them focus on doing film, so it's not really just writing anymore. And um, so, so that's, that's kind of an interesting development, and, and it, is, it is a change, you know. Right. So, so, I mean, I think that there is a lot of movement to try to um, change things in that, in that area. Your research interests, uh, we talk about a couple of comments on women's studies and translational studies and also utopian studies. Right, yeah. Well, um, at Purdue we are um, required to um, do research because, you know, it's a faculty position. And so, um, so I still have my interests, you know, in literature, various, various um, aspects of, of literature. Um, utopian studies, you know, I got involved in that at one point, um, you know, I, you know, I sent in a paper proposal to the MLA and, um, you know, it was accepted and then the lady who um, was leading that session, you know, on feminist utopias invited me to, you know, join the Society for Utopian Studies. So, you know, I went to that um, organization for a number of years. Now, at Purdue, though, they do try to, um, you know, require that you do um, work in library science. So that's one of the requirements. So, so I have tried to um, combine my interests in, um, in literature, you know, with um, interests in library science. One way of doing that is to do a um, bibliography. Um, I did um, a bibliography on feminist utopias. Um, it was, what was it called? It was called Feminist Utopia as a Starter Set or something like that. It was published in um, Collection Development. It was just really basically um, a bibliography um, that of, of not only utopias, feminist utopias, there were a few, some of those, but also different places that if you were a librarian starting a collection in this area, you know, where to go to find new titles to buy for that collection. So. 
So that was one example of that. Um, that was early in my career. I also um, have still an interest in translation studies, and so um, I did some encyclopedia articles for the Encyclopedia of Literary Translation into English. I think I did about seven articles for that. Um, most recently, this um, February, um, I did a choice bibliographic essay. Um, this is um, a regular feature in Choice Magazine, it's a, it's a bibliographic essay, yeah. and I did one on um, translation studies, yeah. which came out this February. So, um, yeah, so those are, are some examples okay. of, of right. different things. The um, Tuesday Talks will comment on that, and also then the next time the Annual Literary Awards, those two items you've been sort of involved in. Yeah. The um, Tuesday Talks was nice. Yeah, the Tuesday Talks, we, we, um, we in the Hissey Library, um, you know, got together and um, decided to try to offer these um, drop-in workshops. And um, I think we, we went through, every year we did something different. We went through a different title. You know, at some point we settled on Tuesday Talks at the library. And um, I and my colleagues would um, come up with um, different topics that we thought, you know, the faculty and students um, needed to know about. You know, sometimes they were databases. Um, sometimes they were resources in a particular um, subject area, you know, like Larry Mikitek did several in, you know, history. He, he did, you know, quite a few different ones. In fact, you know, we got a little bit creative, you know. Um, Larry did one on Wikipedia and um, so, you know, so different things like that. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, since it was, you know, totally voluntary, Sometimes we um, did not get very many people coming to them. Sometimes we did get quite a few. Um, JP did one on um, <coughs> dissertations, you know, where to find um, dissertations. And, you know, at one point he had, you know, like about 12 people came in that. So, so it was really, it was kind of an experiment, right. you know. But um, we ceased doing that when it seemed as if, you know, we weren't, it was, you know, too much effort for not enough not enough Paper. people, patrons. Right. So, um, so that was interesting. Now, the, the literary awards thing, um, at some point, um, the, the literary awards is a program that is offered by the English department um, every year in the spring. And what they do is, um, they um, send out a call across the state, really, I think through high schools, for students to submit their writings. And, um, and they get all kinds of um, submissions, not only from you know, high schools across the state, also you know, from Purdue students as well. And then um, they have various committees. They have all of these awards. They have a long list of awards. And, um, and it's, but it's mostly the English faculty, you know, read over these um, submissions, you know, and, um, and give, give out the awards. And they know. always have a guest speaker, correct? Yeah, and then um, they will have a banquet in, at which they present all of these awards, at which um, some um, prominent um, person, writer, you know, is asked to speak. And they've had some really, if you look over their list, they've had some very prominent people. I over mean, the most, years. yeah, most famously Tennessee Williams, you know. Um, and so, so at some point they reached a point where um, the authors were really charging, you know, too much money, more money than the English department could afford. And so Emily Mobley, who was the dean of libraries at that time, stepped in and offered to help them with this. And so at that point, they um, wanted to assign somebody. I think one of part of her agreement was that somebody from the li should re represent the libraries on this committee. Well, um, I, I was assigned. Um, in fact, I didn't even know that I was on this um, committee until the head of that committee sent me an email. I think it was Dino Faluga at the time. He says, "Well, well, I'm not really sure. You know." 
what to do with someone from the library on this committee. <laughs> and, so, um, and so that's the first I heard about that I was even on that committee. So, um, so, but I mean, it turned out that it seemed like it was because they had everything in hand, you know, they were planning things. I think the idea was that, you know, I would give some feedback into who the speaker would be. Um, but they did not, it turned out that they never actually met as a committee. They just, you know, communicated through, um, through emails yeah. and different people were in charge well, of di often the case. different things. And so, I mean, so at one point, I think it was when Don Platt was the head of it, you know, I said, well, I feel kind of funny being on, he, he explained to me how it worked, you know, and why I had never been invited to any committee meetings. And so I said, well, I feel kind of funny on this, you know, being on this committee and not doing anything. So he said, well, you can help us with our publicity. So at that point, I, um, you know, I asked to be notified, you know, and, and get their posters and, you know, ensure that we, <coughs> we have a little display on the um, Literary Awards banquet, you know, in one of our, our, our display cases. And then I go to the, um, the banquets and um, it's, you know, for the a while. The library usually has a table too, don't they? Have yeah, they? now they, now the libraries have a table, right. you know, and it's, and sometimes I've been, you know, allowed to shake hands with the awardees. So, but I mean, it is really a very, a very enjoyable nice. thing, it's, it's, you know. It's been going for a long time. Yeah, for a right. long, right. for a long time and it was, I mean, it was really good the library could Right. Help them exactly. with it. Um, let's see, awards and honors. I know one that you got was the uh, Arthur O. Lewis from the Society of Utopian Studies. You received that. Right, yeah. Um, I received that, um, oh, what was that, 1991 or something when I was still an untenured scholar. It was it was for a paper that I'd, I'd written for the That's nice to get. The con con you recognize. Yeah. Yeah, right. right. And you've been in the American Library Association, Women's Studies section, and you were the chair of the Literatures and English section for, in what, 2001? Right, yeah, okay. for, yeah for, for three years. And, um, and then um, later in 2005, I was chair of the program committee. And so, um, which meant that, you know, that I organized the program with, with the, my other committee members and, um, and moderated. Uh, yeah. How about uh, hobbies? Any special hobbies or special interests that you care to share with us? Well, I like to do, you know, I, I really have so many interests sometimes that it's hard, hard to know, you know, what, what to focus on, you know. I mean, I still have my, um, my literary interests. I still, you know, like to do research in, in literature and, you know, attend different um, conventions. For you know, I belong to the Society for the Association of Scandin for the for the advancement of Scandinavian studies, you know, um, Utopian studies, um, MLA, Modern Language Association. So, so I still like I, I'm still very interested in you know reading literature. Um, I'm also um, you know I'm I'm both like a city girl and a country girl rolled into one because I enjoy cultural attending cultural events. Um, I like to go to Indianapolis and Chicago and see plays. Plus, you know, I go to all the convos events. Well, not all of them, but a lot, a of, lot them of them here. Are. And, you know, I faithfully attend Purdue Theater. Um, I go to the dance productions. Um, and I've been going to the, um, the HD transmissions at the um, movie theater, East Side Nine, and opera for the opera thing. So, so there's that side to me. But also a nice thing about living in Indiana are the state parks, and that's another thing I love doing is going and um, staying in the state parks and hiking the trails. And stuff. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Do you have a Purdue tradition that you would share? Do you have any tradition that you'd like to share with us? Sometimes people, I'll give an example, sometimes people still boil make or special as an example, or some faculty have said that they enjoy the commencement, so, but if you... Yeah, I can't or say. Or the, the yeah. Lions Fountain, sometimes people, I mean, they walk by that and they get kind of a kick out of that. And uh, uh, some of them remember when the students used to wear their cords, the senior cords, and some 
even Brian Lamb told me he still has his. He doesn't know whether he can wear them, but he can still <laughs> he still has them. Well, I can't I can't say that it's my favorite tradition. It might even be my unfavorite tradition. But uh -huh. this um, Saturday, um, oh, you know the um, before they have a game, they have the all, the, all of the drinking breakfast club yes. business. Mm -hmm. And at some point during my tenure here, they started wearing costumes. I'm, they ha they had they had the breakfast clubs before I came here. But they did not always have the costumes. That started, you know, at some point in the 1990s. Very I, creative. Yeah, I don't know when they started that. But, I mean, now they probably think it's a centuries-old tradition, and it isn't. It's a fairly new tradition. Right. When we get off, I'll tell you a comment on that. Uh, outstanding event? you have one that you'd like to share with us? Well, I did enjoy my sabbatical in... Um, in Copenhagen, I, cool. I enjoyed staying there for. You know, have for you been back to visit since, there. or are you plan maybe you? I did. Time to do it? I did once. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But yeah, I mean that was, that was good. I don't, you know, outstanding events. It would be hard to to choose. Sure, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> and the next stage, post Purdue. What are your tentative plans? Well, I'm going to stay in the area for a while. Um, since you know, since I bought this house, um, I want to really. You know, get that house. That's my first priority. Is get that house. You know, the way I want it. So it'll be a comfortable, have time to do that now. Comfortable place to live. Right. You know, and um, you know, there are still things that I like to go to in Chicago. You know, I like to make trips to Chicago and Indianapolis. Also, I have um, some friends who um, retired. These are way back from my friends in Wharton, Oregon, Wharton High School. And they have moved to um, Iron. What is it? Iron something, Michigan. Iron Town, Ironton, or something like that. I think it's there was um, a town similar. Iron something. Like I think it's Ironwood. Oh, could Michigan? Be, could be. So, so I would like to go up there, and actually, I would like to, you know, make a make a trip around it. You know, kind of leisurely drive up there. It's way over in the. They're Youpers now. It's in the Upper Peninsula. Right, so they've right. gone from Oregonian to Youpers. And so, um, so yeah, I think that would be an interesting trip to take. Just go, go and visit them, you know, and actually go around Lake Michigan, you know. All right. Yeah. Take so a little tour. Yeah. Take a little tour, yeah. That would be fun, you know. And then, I mean, I have, I have another friend in um, L.A., you know. She's invited me. She just recently moved into a condo. So, yeah, so there, so there are different kinds of trips like that, you know. I might think about, you know, Going back to Scandinavia, I would still like to, you know, go back right. to Scandinavia. There's still some. I think you've got a few like good things see. on the offering. Right. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Did anything in closing that you'd like to say, or something I forgot to ask? Um, I can't think of anything right okay. now. Thank you, Christine. I really okay. appreciate that.